I want to talk to you about corporate personhood and all the ways that we are trying to deal with this bizarre Supreme Court doctrine that corporations are people and that money is speech. Now, first of all, it's important to understand that there are, at law, two types of persons. There are natural persons and artificial persons. Natural persons are you and me. They are human beings. Artificial persons are pretty much anything else that's been created by human beings. Churches, nonprofit organizations, unions, corporations, for-profit corporations, governments. And they have to have some standing as a person, these artificial persons, in order to be able to pay taxes, in order to be sued or sue, in order to own property, in order to to conduct business, sign contracts, things like that. Um, Obviously, an individual would have to sign the contract on behalf of the corporation, but you understand, enter into agreements. Now, nobody's disputed this. I mean, you can look at Blackstone's Law Dictionary in the 1700s and find this distinction between artificial and natural persons. And so, in uh, 1868, when the 14th Amendment was ratified, there was arguably a small mistake in it. Now, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were ratified after the Civil War in order to end slavery, to strip slavery out of the Constitution. And the 14th Amendment says, No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person... Now, keep in mind, it starts out with the word citizen, so you think that you're talking about human beings, right? No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor to nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Now, you would think, given that Actually, the, the sentence that precedes this, this is Section 1 of Article four, of uh, um, 14th Amendment. The, the very first sentence is, All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. In other words, slaves too, former slaves too. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property, etc. So, Back in the 1880s, the railroads basically bought off parts of the, you know, Stephen J. Field and others on the Supreme Court and advanced this idea that because it says person, it doesn't say natural person in the 14th Amendment, that as persons, these corporations had rights under the, under the, under the 14th Amendment, and therefore they should have rights under the Constitution, that the 14th Amendment granted them access to other constitutional rights, like the First, First Amendment right of free speech. It was a bizarre doctrine. The first time it was presented to the Supreme Court in the uh, late 1870s, it was laughed at. I mean, literally laughed at. The Chief Justice at the time called it ridiculous and threw the case out. But Stephen J. Field, who was the Ninth Circuit Court judge and a member of the Supreme Court, back then you did both. The members of the court, three months out of the year they were in D.C., nine months out of the year they did what was called riding the circuit. They were the circuit court judges. Stephen J. Field was in the pocket of, I mean, he was openly, the railroads had said that they would run him for president in the uh, election of of uh, 1890 1888 or 1892 if he would rule in their favor if he could make this happen that corporations would get this power and over time corporations have gotten that power and it has been given to them not by our elected representatives not by we the people not not a single state legislature has ever voted in favor of giving corporations the rights of constitutional rights never No city has ever done it. No state has ever done it. No county has ever done it. It has never been done federally. Only the Supreme Court. And then on top of that, after you got Lewis Powell put on the Supreme Court by by Richard Nixon in the early 70s, you get get this uh, Buckley versus Vallejo case in the 80s, which said that not only that, you know, uh, money is speech. Now, I always thought money was money. You know, property. 
But apparently because you can use money to buy advertising, money is speech. And these two doctrines came together in Citizens United to say, you know, ultimately and penultimately and once and for all, corporations are people and money, are, money is speech. Now, there's, there's a lot of nuance to that, but that's basically it. So what do we do about this? There are some people who are suggesting we should have a constitutional convention. This is provided for in the Constitution. If three quarters of the states get together and say, hey, you know, let's open the whole thing up and tinker with it. We can rewrite the entire Constitution. I would advise strongly against that, given the kind of power that corporate uh, corporations and billionaires have in America today. I would advise strongly against that. Another solution would be to use Article 3, Section 2, which says that Congress has the right to regulate the Supreme Court. Article 3, Section 2. The court shall have appellate jurisdiction both as to law and fact with such exceptions and under such regulations as the Congress shall make. So Congress could pass a law literally tomorrow saying the Supreme Court does not have the authority to rule on whether or not money is speech or on whether or not corporations are people. Congress could pass that law. It would be entirely constitutional. And under the Constitution, they would have the power to shove that down the throat of the, of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, of course, even though they were never given the power anywhere in the Constitution to strike down a law, would strike down that law. And we would have a constitutional crisis, and it would be a fascinating time. I'd love to see it happen. But it's not going to happen because Congress isn't going to do that because they're wimps. So the third option is for we the people to rise up and say, we are going to amend the Constitution. We're going to amend the Constitution to say corporations are not people and money is not speech. And here's where it gets really tricky. The amendment over at movetoamend.org is very clean and very straightforward. It says no, not just no corporation, but no artificial entity of any sort. I'm par- This is my language, not theirs, but this is essentially what it says. You can read it over at movetoamend.org shall be considered a person under the purposes of the Constitution. In other words, shall have constitutional rights. So whether it's a church, whether it's a labor union, uh uh-oh. Whether it's a nonprofit corporation, uh uh-oh. Whether it's a PAC, they don't have rights of persons. And money is not considered speech. Now, there are some Democrats and some progressives who are saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's just limit the power of for-profit corporations. Now, I think this is a terrible mistake. Carl Rove, you know, uh, Crossroads GPS, that's a nonprofit corporation. ALEC is a nonprofit corporation. But they say, you know, well, let's just limit the power of for-profit corporations because we don't want to hurt unions. Well, unions are already regulated with regard to, corp- with, uh, with regard to, uh, to political speech by the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947. If you're a union member and you don't want to give money to, to political speech, you can say so, and the union will not take that money out of your dues. So be careful. Maine is going to be proposing and voting on an amendment which would only limit for-profit corporations. I think this is a mistake to go halfway. And beyond that, it may get corporate money out of politics, but it's not going to get corporate money out of my food supply. It's not going to get, you know, our food supply is controlled by a small number of people. It's not going to get corporate money out of our media. It's not going to get corporate money out of the rest of our lives. This is the Tom Hartman Program. The fact of the matter is, if we want to empower our legislatures to take on corporate power, we have to say all forms of associations are not humans and money is not speech, period. Welcome back, 20 minutes past the hour. Let me just, just you know, close this loop here about uh, Citizens United. Citizens United was a decision, but it was not the decision. There, were over, there have been over 30 decisions by the Supreme Court since the 1880s, which have asserted that corporations have some form of rights or standing under the Constitution uh, that is not dissimilar from that given to human beings, which was not the idea of the founders. 
In fact, as I, as I just read, Thomas Jefferson, 1816, letter to Samuel Kercheval, those seeking profits where they given total freedom would not be the ones to trust to keep government pure and our rights secure. Indeed, it has always been those seeking wealth who are the source of corruption in government. No other depositories of power have ever yet been found which not, did not end in converting to their own profit the earnings of those committed to their charge. And then he went on to say, if the overgrown wealth of an individual, you think uh, Shelley Adelson, the Koch brothers? If the overgrown wealth of an individual be deemed dangerous to the state, with a capital S, the best corrective is the law of equal inheritance to all in equal degree. So, what he was talking about there was basically when they die, take their wealth and split it up among everybody. I don't think we've ever gone that far. I'm, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend going that far, but that was Jefferson's idea. Because he saw, he had seen a country corrupted by the wealthy. It's called the United Kingdom. We separated from that country. So anyhow, the point that I wanted to make, just to, just to close this thing up, just to close this loop up, is that it is not enough to get money out of politics. We could, we could take our time, and it's going to take an enormous amount of time and effort and, and, and you know, blood, sweat, and tears, as it were, um, or at least sweat and tears, to amend the Constitution of the United States. And we could make all that effort to roll back Citizens United and say, no, Congress can make, can make laws, because Citizens United basically blew up big chunks of McCain-Feingold, to say, no, Congress can pass laws that regulate money in politics and that regulate corporate activity in politics. We could do that. It's not enough. Because corporate power in the United States is not just corrupting government. When Ronald Reagan made the decision in 1982 to stop enforcing the Sherman Antitrust Act, those of you old enough to remember, you know what I'm talking about. And if, you, and if you're not old enough to remember, go back and watch some of the old TV shows from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, or any of the old movies. Every downtown in America was filled with small, locally owned businesses. Every, we didn't have giant malls, but there were strip malls back in the 80s and the 70s. They became popular, actually, in the 50s and 60s, um, these malls. Every single business was a locally owned business. People would start businesses, and they would pass them down in their families. You'd have dry cleaners and pharmacies and, and tobacco and, uh, tobacconists and, and uh, shoe stores that had literally been in families for generations. I remember East Lansing, we, I, I used to live in an apartment over Jacobson's. Jacobson's was, an, was a furniture store that had been started by Grandpa Jacobson back in 1890 or something like that. Been through like four or five generations. Around the corner was a, was a pharmacy, and the guy who owned the pharmacy, was a, he had become a really old guy. He was in his 80s, and Louise, when she was a teenager, one of her part-time jobs was as a home health nurse, and she was... You know, she'd go over to his house and make sure he was taking his medications. This is the guy who owned the pharmacy. It was locally owned. And he was going to leave it to his kids. This is how America used to be. And then Reagan made the decision, you know, government is too big. Because it's preventing big business from wiping out these small businesses. The Sherman Antitrust Act that was passed in 1890... That's big government. That's government saying you can't have mergers and acquisitions beyond a certain point. And you can't have people who just make their living jamming businesses together and laying off workers, which is, you know, what Mayor Omni did. And so when, he, when, when Reagan stopped enforcing the Sherman Act in 82, we had this wave. It was called the mergers and acquisitions mania or the M&A mania. And people like Michael Milken and Mitt Romney became... Multimillionaires, billionaires, off the process of taking multiple businesses, jamming them together into much larger businesses, getting economies of scale, driving out of business the small locally owned competitors to the point now that you can walk into a mall anywhere in America 
I walk into a mall here in Washington, D.C., and it looks no different than a mall that I walk into in Portland, Oregon, or Lansing, Michigan. There's the Apple Store. There's the, 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 the Chain Jeweler, the Zales Jeweler. There's the, there's the Macy's, or, there, or, the, or one of the other Federated Department Store brands. There's the Victoria's Secret. There's the, you know, I mean, you know the list, right? There's no small locally owned businesses left anymore for all practical purposes. You might see a few here and there. They're hanging out by their fingernails. And if it looks like they're going to be really successful, they're going to do it really well. If it has to do with software, Microsoft will just build it into its operating system and squash them like a bug, or Apple will. Europe, by the way, doesn't like this. They keep prosecuting Microsoft for doing this kind of thing. Violating their antitrust laws. But here it's just fine. Because we want our government small and our corporations big. You have five insurance companies that control about 90% of the entire marketplace in, insur in health insurance. And so there's no competition. So we pay twice as much as anybody else in the world for health insurance. And meanwhile, Stephen J. Hemsley, the guy who is the CEO of United Healthcare, has taken over one billion dollars in compensation. Has over a hundred people making over a million dollars a year. Because we hey, we want small government, which means big corporations. It's not what I want. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Call 866-987-THOM. So if we're going to amend the Constitution to limit corporate power and say corporations are not people and money is not spe speech, let's do it right across the board, not just with regard to political speech. <laughs>